man in his lifetime has built few things that can compare with the grace and beauty of a ship. A ship is a masterpiece of craftsmanship, design, and structural soundness. A testimony to man's engineering capabilities. But in the building of ships, man has gone farther than designing strength in her keel and power in her guns. He has given something of himself. He has lent dignity to his architecture. Whether the ship be a mighty attack carrier of today's modern mobile navy, or a four-masted brigantine schooner, there is a certain nobility about her. The sight of a ship underway has fed man's imagination for centuries. And the desire of young men to go to sea in ships is greater than ever before. The challenge of the sea remains forever unchanged. But the young men of today's Navy who meet that challenge are the most highly trained specialists in the history of sea power. They are proud young men, sharing a proud seagoing heritage, creating new traditions. Whatever flag a man sails under, he has one thing in common with his fellow seamen, a hearty respect for the vagaries of the sea and faith in his ship. It is fitting that these men who follow the sea should congregate in recognition of the common bonds that unite them. The sailors of the United States Atlantic Fleet, who have often visited the world's most romantic ports, welcome to their own country the 12,000 sailors of 17 visiting navies. The theme for this review is Freedom of the Seas. It was a high spot in the eight-month Jamestown Festival. 350 years ago, the establishment of the Jamestown Colony in Virginia marked the beginning of a continuous flow of peoples from many lands to what is now the United States of America. Countries invited to participate in the International Review are those who were active in the exploration and colonization of the Americas, and those nations comprising the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The ships stand in to Hampton Roads in preparation for the steel parade. Entering inland waters is the contingent from France, led by the cruiser de Grasse. From Canada, the destroyer escorts Ottawa and Assiniboine, representing Great Britain, the impressive Ark Royal, largest of the British carriers. And from Spain is the colorful windjammer, the training schooner Juan Sebastian del Cano. A proud, graceful lady, she will bring to the review a nostalgic reminder of the days when canvas was king. As the ships arrive, Pier space at the naval base at Norfolk is at a premium. But powerful Navy tugs, driven by the Navy's own traffic cops, skillfully nudge the giant warships into their berths. There are over a hundred ships to be moored, including the United States participants. And the facility with which well-trained Navy men handle these ships of all sizes is a tribute to the teamwork and detailed planning characteristic of Navy men everywhere. Local yard tugs assist the 46,000 ton Ark Royal toward her assigned berth at Pier 5. Bucking a stiff wind and swift current, the steel lady is edged slowly into position. As the ships are berthed, each commanding officer is greeted by his personal host, usually an officer of the United States of equivalent rank. The host will be responsible for seeing to the needs of the guest ship. This will entail everything from provisioning, and fueling, to medical care and recreation. It seems that this young lady has taken it upon herself to act as hostess to the men of the Spanish brigantine. Displaying true Latin hospitality, these hardy canvas haulers spin yarns on the taffrail to the fascination of their visiting landlubbers. As a part of the official entertainment, 
Jose Greco and his troop perform aboard the Norwegian destroyer Trondheim. Truly a melting pot of nations where language is no barrier and brothers of the sea meet in mutual respect for each other. They are bound together by an organization for peace, and the sea is their common meeting ground. A Portuguese sailor, whose ancestors fished off the Grand Banks, gets checked out on modern mooring methods by an American white hat from Nebraska. All four are destroyer men and are part of a strong alliance dedicated to the preservation of peace. No sailor can remain away from a ship for too long a time, even when on liberty. And these French tars prove no exception. This replica of the Susan Constant, one of the original ships that brought the settlers to Jamestown Colony, attracts the attention of these French salts. It is doubtful that these modern sailors have the agility for climbing the rat lines that their forefathers had. But the spirit is there, just the same. At headquarters of the Supreme Allied Command, Atlantic, a more formal celebration is taking place. Coincidental to the International Fleet Review are the national holiday celebrations of both Great Britain and Portugal. On Great Britain Day, the Royal Marines present arms as the British flag is bent to the halyard. This annual event is in recognition of Her Majesty's birth and is celebrated by a day of parades and festivities throughout the United Kingdom. All ships present are full dressed during these national holidays and the fleet landing is a colorful sight as signal flags and pennants are hoisted to the forefront. One of the highlights during the week-long series of events is the dedication of the International Naval Review commemorative stamp by the Postmaster General. The aircraft carrier USS Saratoga is host for the historic event and the Chief of Naval Operations is on hand. Early the following morning, mooring lines are slipped and the ships move out to take station for the International Fleet Review. Anchored in two columns, the line of ships stretches out for 14 miles, awaiting the reviewing party. The reviewing officer, the Secretary of Defense, is embarked in the reviewing ship, the Navy's modern guided missile cruiser, USS Canberra. Canberra is joined by her sister ship, the guided missile cruiser, USS Boston with the Secretary of the Navy on board. And the tactical command ship, USS Northampton, with the Chief of Naval Operations as senior officer. Also present is Fleet Admiral William F. Halsey, who led the Third Fleet through the Central Pacific to victory during World War II. Traditional 19-gun salute is rendered in honor of the Secretary of Defense. And the Canberra's gun crew on the saluting battery is kept busy, triggering the reply. As the reviewing party proceeds down the column of foreign ships, Naval and Marine Air Commands conduct an impressive flyover. More than 200 aircraft flying in rigid formation form a canopy of air power over the reviewing dignitaries. Seventeen countries render honors to their navies. Their ships, whether they be battle wagons or destroyers, minesweepers or sailing ships, are symbols of a proud tradition, upholding the freedom of the seas a day to be remembered, the International Fleet Review.